All right, Luke 23, verses 34, as we see um, the first thing. Um, I'll say the, uh, these are the three things that um, we're, we're going to be looking at. Okay, Father, uh, uh, the final words, but these are the first three words we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All right, secondly, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, paradise and dirty uh, woman, behold, behold thy son. And then he saith unto the disciple, behold thy mother. Um, so the first phrase here, uh, Father, forgive them, uh, for they know not uh, what they do. Now, um, in this particular case, we see that uh, it was uh, it was Jesus, right? Jesus speaking here. Uh, if you've got the letters in red, and we are talking about Jesus' final words. All right. Um, Jesus has a petition here. Now, in the past, if you could turn back with me in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. Um, put a place bookmark there as well. But we see that uh, on at least two occasions in Scripture, we see Jesus forgiving the sins of man. So in Matthew chapter 9 is our first example. And also in Luke chapter 7, verse 48, you can go and look at that at your leisure. Um, but here in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, uh, now this is the story of, the, um, and I remember uh, someone having the title of the sermon going along the lines of, a four of a kind beats a full house, all right, of this story, because the house was full, um, but we were talking about the four friends, and that was the focus on it. But, you know. um, but um, here it says, And behold, they brought him, this is the four friends, um, uh, And behold, they brought him uh, uh, a man sick of the palsy, lying in bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Right? And both occasions that we've that we'll got here in, um, in uh, Matthew 9, chapter 2, uh, chapter 9, uh, Matthew 9, verse 2, and also in Luke chapter 7, verse 48, this, the reactions from the religious guys on the day was the same. All right? In verse 3, it says, And behold, certain of the scribes said within the south, This man blasphemous. All right? They think Jesus as a man. So the conclusion they come to is this man is blaspheming. Why? Because, that, because he's forgiven his sins, right? And only one being forgives sin, right? And that's God, right? God is the only one that forgives sins. And um, <laughs> in verse 4 it says, Jesus knowing their thoughts and said, Wherefore think ye evil in their hearts? For whether is it, it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins, and then he looks into that. Uh, then he saith, the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thine, uh, go unto thine house. And he rose and departed unto his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Right, so Jesus himself had directly forgiven sins. Right? Um, what we see here, um, as we go back to our passage in um, Luke, instead of forgiving those around him, he turns to prayer. And um, at some point between then, in this um, Matthew chapter 9, and now where he's um, um, on, on his deathbed, on the cross there, I say deathbed, but on the cross, ready to die for your sins, he had, um, he had given up some of his Godhead qualities. Right? And he was limited to his human resources, and that especially of prayer. Right? He, he turns to prayer. And um, so secondly, what we're going to look at is, is the actual prayer request that, that, he, that he gives. Right? The petition that he gives to God. And that was, Father, forgive them. Now, um, if you're in a situation like that, us and our sinful human bodies, um, being, and there's some uh, some real um, harsh things that was done to to uh, to Christ. Um, as I turn over and, and, and read uh, some of the things 
um, that were done to him. Um, and, and verse 34, and Jesus said, um, Okay, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they um, parted his raiments and, um, and cast lots. Right? Other, um, uh, other passages um, describe uh, him being spat on and being whipped. And um, I know that's not something I would accept. Right? If I was to pray to God on how to react to those sorts of people that... I, I mean, I've, I've never been spat on, but... Man, that will just make me angry, right? Father, just do away with them. That would be my prayer, right? In my sinful body. I hope it wouldn't be after reading all this, but I still don't know, right? I would hope that I would be like, you know, merciful enough and all that sort of stuff to say, Lord, forgive them. But I don't know, right? Um, but Jesus, it wasn't, wasn't a question. Right? Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do. Turn over to um, Matthew, uh, chapter 27. As we see, well, I mean, Jesus was put in a situation, right? He was spat on. He is mocked, beaten, stripped, crowns of thorns, everything under the sun, right? Now, again, being man, if this person was a murderer, if this person had raped, if this person was actual evil, right, you'd almost be like, well, well, he deserves it, right? But... Over in Matthew chapter 27, as he was in court, as they were deciding to kind of find out what he was doing, Pilate comes to this conclusion in uh, verse 24. And if you could bring along with me, it says that when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, that nothing happened, it was, he had done nothing wrong, but rather turmoil was made, he took the water, washed his hands before the multitude, and saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. What well, happened? Is, is the Jewish people had got themselves in a frenzy. He's guilty. Crucify him. And, um, you know, basically peer pressured him to free the other guy instead, who was an actual bad guy, who actual did some murder, who actual deserved to be spat on crown of thorns or, or whatever, who deserved death. But Jesus didn't deserve death. So we've got an innocent person who had done nothing wrong being punished with the maximum punishment in those days. Right? I don't know if it was the maximum. I'm not too sure what it would be. But this was death, right? Death by crucifixion. Right? Yet his prayer was, Father, forgive them. Okay? This is something... That he preached early on. We'll go have a look. Matthew chapter 5. While you're in there. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Okay. And this is practicing what you preach. Right. He preached it early on. <coughs> um, and then Matthew chapter 5. In verse 44 we read. Uh, but I say unto you. Love your enemies. And bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now he's our ultimate example. Christ is our ultimate example. Um, Christ is our ultimate example. Um, and we should be striving to be more and more like him every day. And, and sometimes it's, it's not easy. Right? It's, it's not easy. Right? He's, he lives a standard. Uh, and which is, you know, and it's an example, right, that we should look to, right? Understandably, we fail time to time, even as Christians, even even as leaders, we struggle, right? Every day is a struggle. 
right? And just because um, you may see some um, some pastors, uh, they may seem happy all the time, um, joyful all the time, um, it doesn't mean that they go through struggles, right? Each and every one of us as humans, we, we struggle, and sometimes, um, you know, it's to the point that, you know, we snap, right? Almost wanting to just, just snap, but, um, so it's not just people and sin, it's everyone, right? All, um, all struggle. Um, should we love our enemies? Of course we should, uh, other than it being, um, Oh, and I've got a, a, a few verses that, uh, that I'll get you to look at. But other than that, um, being obedience to God's word, um, here we have, uh, for the truth's sake which dwell in us and shall be with us forever. So the, the truth is in us. We have the love of God which is in us in these two verses here. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And 1 John 4 verse 7, it says, Their beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. So we should share that love around, especially here in the context of this, to our Christian brothers and sisters. All right, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So not just the church, but everyone that is saved, we should share that love um, uh, abroad. Um, we know John 3 16. Turn over to 2 Peter. Um, chapter 3, verse 9, so John three sixteen, one of the most uh, known verses in the Bible, or argue the known verse of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not um, perish, but have everlasting life. But Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 9, um, so it says here that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, this is God's plea, right? That all should come to repentance. And does doesn't include that the people that we come across with that we like, right? It also includes the people that we come across that may have spit on your face, right? That may have I don't know, they have or not. It may have stripped you and been you or whatever, right? Both sides, um, and that's the example that Jesus gave, right? That includes your enemies. So it doesn't matter what your enemies have done for you, you your concern for them should not be a physical one. Your concern for them should be a spiritual one. Right? Um, and again, it's uh, hard. Um, it is hard. Um, but that's where our mindset should should be. Um, uh, lastly, we see. Okay, so the prayer request was for the Father to forgive them. We know what type of people they were enemies. Uh, but then we see their ignorance, and that's in the phrase, for they know not what they do. Acts 3, turn with me there. Acts 3. Okay, so see, so thirdly, we see that uh, the the ignorance in which they are doing whatever they're doing, the the um, the actions, they're doing it in uh, ignorance. So it's ignorance on their part. If they had known what they did, uh, maybe they wouldn't have done it. If they knew who they were doing it to, maybe they wouldn't have done it. And Acts chapter three verse fifteen is. Um, as Peter here is, is, is preaching, he's um, and going down to verse 17, it says there, and they killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. In his name, through faith, uh, uh, in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I what that through ignorance ye did it, so did also your rulers. So Jesus was saying that they didn't know what they were doing. They obviously knew what they were doing. They were crucifying this man, Jesus, but 
they did not know the extent of what their actions were doing. Um, turn over to um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. So um, Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, who persecuted Christians to their death, he was a man that was um, was against the church. Um, he he um, before his conversion, he, he he railed on the Christians. He would seek them out, he'd, um, arrest them, um, persecute them, and put them to death. Um, Here yeah, he says uh, uh, later on in First Timothy, in, in this uh, particular passage, he said, "Who was before a blasphemer?" And a persecutor, and injurious, injurious, and injurious, injurious. Here we go. But I obtained mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly, in belief. So we see here that God is merciful, and Paul here obtains that mercy. He's far more merciful than we ever deserve. Yes, we've got. Plenty of sin, which will condemn us. Right? Not short of that. Plenty of it. But God is looking deeper. He's made a way that we did not deserve. And it's because of that love that he has for us. You know, the love that God has for you. He's made a way uh, for us. Um, because he knows that in reality, if we knew the truth, especially for those that know Christ now, we would have embraced his son. Uh, Jesus' prayer on the cross says that he found a way to forgive sins, to forgive us of our sins. Uh, last passage on this point, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, again, uh, going in the same vein as Paul and as of Peter as well. First uh, Corinthians chapter two verse eight where it says there which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? If they hadn't known the whole story from start to finish, right? They would not have crucified uh, the Lord of glory. Now turn back to um, Luke as we look at the next saying. So that was saying number one. Um, the next one we see is in uh, Luke again, Luke chapter 23. And I'll already read this passage from uh, 35. And, and it says there, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, and derided them, saying, if he, uh, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, uh, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And this and a superscription excuse me, also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Excuse me. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hung railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received in, uh, the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. Again, another <coughs> saying that he was innocent. This guy is innocent of the crimes that he's saying. Then he turns to Jesus, and he said unto him, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, and here's the second words, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou uh, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Um, the repentant thief uh, believed Jesus was the Messiah he claimed to be and wanted to enter this kingdom. And it's likely that while Jesus was on the cross revealed to these men the nature of his kingdom, not too sure, it doesn't say anything there on how uh, that came about. 
Uh, one guy railed him, railed on him, blasphemed, spoke evil of him, um, becoming more hardened in the guilt that, of his sin. Meanwhile, the other one was repentant. Um, now, some may come to Christ in, in their deathbed. And if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, if you don't know you're going to heaven, don't wait till your deathbed. Today is the day of salvation. Uh, now this, um, <coughs> uh, this word here, well, we, we see it really, I said, unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That word paradise, um, uh, Persian orig origin, meaning garden of pleasure. Right? No weeds. Okay? No wood. Yeah. Great place. Right? Um, constant watering. But the, um, the, the paradise um, quite often refers back to uh, Genesis as well, um, and the, the Garden of Eden. Uh, filled with trees, shrubs, flowers, fountains, all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, again, Garden of Eden springs into mind. Uh, it was like a place of happiness attached to uh, mansions, places, uh, uh, palaces of rich, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but a couple of things we see um, about um, uh, this place as we, as we looked at this passage, um, the soul after death exists separately from the body. Okay, the soul is in paradise, of, uh, of this man, he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But the body goes to the grave. Uh, secondly, we see that as uh, immediately after death, the righteous soul will be happy. Okay? Mm. And problems with that act. Just make my blood boil just a little bit. Not as much as can believe that. Mm. Um, um, so he's happy. He's secure of a uh, assure of a future resurrection. All right. Um, today thou shalt be with me. All right. He's talking about something in the future. All right. As soon as the body is cut, um, the soul will be um, in paradise. Uh, thirdly, the the promise was made to one thief, showing that the state of righteous differs. From the unsaved, okay, he, he, uh, the other guy, um, didn't get made that promise. And um, the last thing we see is the principal glory of paradise. And if you turn with me to Philippians chapter one, uh, verse twenty-three as well. But the principal glory of paradise isn't paradise itself, but it's seeing the Savior's face, right? To see Jesus and be with Him. Over in Philippians chapter one, verse twenty-three. Uh, we have the, um, again Paul speaking. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 1. And then verse 23. Got a, uh, got a, push, um, a bit of a push and pull situation here from him. Um, in verse 21 it says, For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Okay, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, and yet what shall I choose, I want not. For I am straight betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, I abide in the flesh, it's more needful for you. Okay, there's two options that he's got there. But clearly, there's the better option, right? The far better option of, um, in verse 23. Uh, year 23, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Right? The desire to depart isn't for the mansions that we're about to receive, or to walk the streets of gold, um, have this new body that we're promised. No, it's to be with Christ. That should be our desire uh, when we leave this place. Um, everything else, bonus, great, awesome. Right? But to be with the Saviour, that died for us. That is the principal reason. Um, uh, a couple of things that we see about salvation um, in this passage back in Luke. 
the salvation is offered to uh, anyone at any time and anywhere. Well, that, that, okay, that salvation can be offered to you here in this church. It was offered to this malefactor as he was dying. Anyone on their deathbed, it's offered to anyone at any time, anywhere. Uh, second, we said that salvation is through uh, faith alone uh, and not by works. Right? This man here had no time to work. No time whatsoever. Right? He believed the words of Christ. All right? Didn't have time to go off the cross and, and pass a few tracks around or whatever. Because about to die. And so salvation is through faith alone. It's not through uh, uh, sacramentalism. Okay? The example was the Lord's Supper as confirmation of salvation. It's not because of uh, baptismal regeneration. It's um, so widely uh, taught in some churches today. Uh, purgatory. Widely taught in other churches today. Or uh, universalism. Okay? Universalism as in all's going to be saved, no matter what. Only one thief was saved there. Um, and the last thing we see is that uh, salvation will be rejected by some. Uh, in this account, we see three men on the cross. One was dying for sin. Uh, the second person was dying in sin. And the third person um, was dying from sin. Right. Um, I suppose one more thing about the, uh, this particular um, point as we look back at uh, Luke chapter 23. Um, there were different classes of humanity that was represented in, uh, in this particular um, uh, passage. We have um, the indifferent people. Um, verse 35 says that the people stood beholding. They were beholding. Um, so people that were, you know, looking there for the action. Um, and they were standing there beholding. We have the religious leaders of the time. With, um, uh, the same verse. And the rulers also with them to ride him, saying he saved others. Um, we have the soldiers that parted his garments. All right. And, um, materialistic um, kind of people. And lastly, we see um, earnest seekers as Jesus was going uh, towards him, uh, in verse 28, it says, Jesus turning unto them, saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not uh, for me. And we also have um, the case of the uh, the repentant thief. Right, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. Okay, the wonderful, the wonderful thing about um, salvation is its simplicity. Okay, the gospel message is simple. Right, the death, burial, Resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and, um, and those glow books, um, they put it pretty simple. The ABCs of salvation, still need to add some stuff, but A is admit your sin, and then that is your repentant side of it. Okay, turning from God, uh, turning from sin to God. Secondly, um, uh, B, belief in the work of the cross, and C, call upon the name of the Lord. All right, salvation is, is that simple. That's why even children can be saved. Um, but we should arm ourselves with the ability to, to present the gospel to the lost at any time. At any time. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Right? Be instant in season and out of season. Jesus himself took the opportunity, even in his darkest hour, to get others to heaven. Um, so uh, that would be an encouragement to you as well. Um, whatever situation you find yourself in, always an opportunity um, to witness to others, whether through your actions or through presenting uh, uh, the gospel message to them. Uh, last statement is in uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19.
In verses 26 and 27 it says, um, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciples standing by him whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he saith, uh, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. Took her as his mother. Right? The, the apostle John um, adopted her, I guess, as, as his mother. Um, and uh, so Jesus, in his dying moments, filled with tender and care for his mother, secured for her an adopted son. And he obtained her, for a, uh, obtained her for a home and consoled her grief by John's attention. So John was there to, to be with her. Um, now he addresses her as woman. Woman. Kind of sounds disre disrespectful, I guess. Uh, but um, but there are legitimate reasons why. First of all, there was there was no mark of disrespect. It was um, a usual way of speaking with the Jew and, uh, and with the Jews when they showed the greatest respect to the person they were speaking to. Um, a bit like saying sir or madam, ma madam, madam, madam. Nowadays, um, that was kind of like saying woman, right? But even if this was not the case. Um, he has a, room, well, a, a way of saying woman to her to spare her feelings, right? That's another um, possibility, right? He would not mention the name, um, or even mother would sound, um, or, or a, a name or mother might have um, just hurt a bit, right? Run her so um, heart with additional sorrow that. Um, Maybe he was sparing that. Uh, but the last and, and also uh, another probable reason um, was that there's a whole bunch of mobs here, right? Mobs is going, crucify him, crucify him. And maybe he wanted to conceal her from those types of people and calling her woman. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of people there that wanted him dead. And maybe just to um, distance his relationship to her from them um, could have been a reason. But um, that's uh, him addressing her as woman. Um, he makes provision for his mother. Turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. So we see that um, in the midst of his own sufferings, um, Jesus had the clarity in mind. He had... Um, he was always thinking of others. Right? There was others on his mind. He had the clarity of mind to think of others, as we see in the first couple of instances. Um, but he was to share with his mother's sufferings. And uh, what a model for all children in providing for our parents' needs that have done so much for us. Right? Mary had not wholeheartedly followed Jesus, right? as we um, go back to this passage. Uh, and to what extent she didn't follow Jesus, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but we see here in this passage um, Jesus not granting her and her brethren's request to see them. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46 it says there while he talked to the people behold his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him and then one said unto him behold thy mother and brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee but he answered and said unto them uh, that told him who is my mother and who are my brethren and he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Right? So there's kind of a suggestion there that, that, that um, his mother, his brethren, but really, um, really disciples, I guess, of Jesus at that time. Um, and they come to see him. They come to see Jesus as he was teaching. And um, that this is not the time for me to see them. This is the time for me to minister unto the people. Right? And um, again, the suggestion there is um, uh, for them uh, that they weren't doing well, well, the will of his father. In verse um, 50 of that passage, it says, Whosoever shall not do the will of my father, which is... Um, oh, sorry, whosoever shall do the will of my father, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. 
Uh, he was willing to speak to the uh, people uh, towards his disciples, but not uh, his uh, actual mum and brother. But um, Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verses 1 to 3, um, a lot of, um, I suppose, children know uh, this verse. Wellish. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. Uh, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long in the earth. Right, Honour thy mother and father, or father and mother. Right, this is what he was doing. Um, uh, when we read the sentence, Behold thy son, and then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Now, um, Mary would be um, to John as a mother, and uh, John being the disciple to Jesus, and whom Jesus loved. Now, tradition tells us, uh, Josephus, um, um, not scripture, but it tells us that Mary continued to live with John uh, until 15 years later, after uh, her death, 15 years later. Um, but <clears throat> if we turn to So this is the um, example that we, we should have for all relationships as well. So this is the third point. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 um, and also Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. Because it's not just one caring for another. So it's not just John caring for Mary uh, in their kind of final year, or in Mary's final years. But Jesus would have us care one for another. Right? As a church and um, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be caring, looking out one for another, all right? Not just one way kind of street. Uh, looking out, seeing what's uh, needful for some, um, uh, being a friend. Um, here it says caring uh, one for another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says there, um, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even uh, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And then over in Ephesians chapter 1, which is a, a wee bit back, Ephesians chapter 1. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 5. We're probably on the same page. And it continues on. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love, Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Um, so we are to um, be kind. We are to be tender-hearted. Uh, we are to be forgiven. And we are also to walk in love. Um, here it says uh, in John chapter 13, Verses 34 and 5, uh, 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Right? There should be love for the brethren. There should be love um, for each other. Right? It should love one another. Um, so we read that we should love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, but if we turn over to uh, this is our last passage of the of the uh, the morning over to Galatians, chapter six. Galatians chapter six. And in verse 10, uh, it says that, um, and, uh, as we have therefore opportunity, let us to do good unto all men. Alright, so when, uh, when we're in the, in the works situation, when we're looking for opportunities to be a, a, a blessing, right, we are to do good unto all men. 
right? But then it says there, especially unto them who are the household of faith. It, it, it gives distinction into well, the love that we have for the brethren, but we are also to do good unto them as well, right? Um, distinction between those that are of the household of faith as opposed to those who aren't, I guess, right? Looking for, as we come into church, and as we see um, see people, have our conversations uh, with each other, uh, maybe God uh, puts something in your head that, oh, oh, this guy needs a hand in something, or, or whatever. Um, this guy's struggling, a special, if, if you see someone struggling in, in a spiritual sense, um, do good. Right, do good unto all men, especially those who are in the household of faith. All right, so that's all I've got for you uh, today. But uh, we can learn a lot of things as we um, and as we continue to learn um, uh, more things um, as we continue this um, study on, on the last seven words on the cross. Uh, but the first three dealt with um, Jesus' love for others. Right, Jesus was still um, asking God or praying to God and petition for the um, for people that weren't doing too good to them. Secondly, we see that he was also seeking opportunities to witness, seeking um, souls, looking at the souls of men, and offering them uh, salvation. And also within his own house, within his own brethren, he was also looking out for um, people in his own. In, his, in the house of God, right? And that's how we kind of want to look at this as well, right? Through his eyes, through his, his example. We'll go, um, go ahead and close with a prayer. Father, we thank you for...